You're in this time, huh? I mean, late like last year's, but I'm getting this done as fast as I can, dude. Yeah, not gonna lie, 2021 has been a rough year for me. For what I feel are obvious reasons. I'm not as active on this channel as I would like to be in general, but this year I really couldn't stay motivated, like, at all. Just bring fog all around. But I am determined to talk about video games that I liked. Once again, this video is not in any particular order, and there are plenty of games I wanted to play but didn't have time to, or games that I only played part of. With that said, here are big games I liked. Black Mesa. A remake of Half-Life 1 in development for, what, over a decade at this point? You play as Gordon Freeman, a science with a propensity for murder, going about his sciency day in the Black Mesa facility, but during a test, something goes wrong and now an alien invasion is upon you. Yeah, the original Half-Life is kind of an iconic game, known for stuff like first-person platforming and never once moving the perspective away from Freeman. No cutscenes or anything. Environmental storytelling! <laughs> One thing I always found interesting personally is how the feel of the game shifts from the beginning to the end. You start the game at the zenith of disaster. Things are going to shit, everyone is dying around you, everything wants to kill you, and ammo is scarce. It feels almost like a pseudo-survival horror. Like, definitely not as strict with the ammo, but you need to consider how you approach each situation. When you are in particularly dire straits, it can feel almost like a puzzle figuring out how to get through without becoming a red stain on the wall. Contrast this with the end of the game where you have more ammo than you know what to do with and are instead running and gunning more, leaving a veritable pile of alien corpses in your wake. First you were just trying to survive, now you're here to rain down hell. The remake itself is a solid modernization of the original while still maintaining the feel of it. The visuals are a nice update, like they ain't triple-A or whatever, but they feel fresh. But overall, it feels like another, like, Valve's game. The same design philosophy, the same aesthetics, the same gameplay hook. Zen is also a nice improvement to the original. While I wasn't as down on it as, like, most people, you know, I do like the Black Mesa one more. <laughs> the world still feels alien and hostile, but while feeling more alive. It's not just random geometry, it's an actual alien world. Zem was also expanded significantly beyond what it was in the original, with new like set pieces and new areas and whatnot. Some highlights for me include a Black Mesa research station and a Vorticon town you visit. All in all, Black Mesa is a solo throwback to the eras of 90s FPSs. Nasia. A single-player social deduction game, specifically a take on games such as Mafia. Each player is given a hidden role, some of whom are the titular Nasia, imposters who have replaced a crew member aboard the ship. Each night they eliminate a single other crew member and it's up to the remaining crew members to weed out the Nasia and vote to put them in cryosleep. All the while, you're trapped in a time loop living out these set of days over and over again as you learn more about the crew and your own situation. Now, unlike typical social deduction games, the social interaction is, well, simulated. In the place of social manipulation, Nasia has light RPG elements. Basically, various moves you can use to shift suspicion around either away from yourself or onto slash away from a particular character. Plus various stats and all. Social deduction games have been a part of multiplayer gaming for a while. From Gmod and the game mode that's proven to be one of YouTube's favorite content mills, to the current favorite content mill, Among Us. Among Us. Although for Nasia, the comparison that is most apt is to Town of Salem, if just because of how they both use Mafia as a clear base to build off of, and I think comparing the two reveals Nasia's biggest strength and biggest fault, namely the lack of real people. On the one hand, this definitely limits how much Nasia can do with the social deduction mechanics. After all, humans are unpredictable while computers are not. After a while, you do kinda either get high enough stats or just learn enough about the game that it becomes not that much of a challenge to get by. On the other hand, you don't have to deal with people. And in the beginning, the social deduction is genuinely compelling. And near the end of the game, I was still interested in uncovering the story. Who are these people? Why are we here? It's not like Hall of Fame visual novel story, but I was certainly engaged. Overall, Nasi is a game with intriguing characters and an interesting hook. Amogus. Omori. A game that's both a cute and fun Earthbound style RPG and intense and unnerving psychological horror. The main reason it works as well as it does is because of how one part feeds into the other, both narratively and thematically. One mode is an escape from the other, after all. 
you spend most of your time in cute RPG land. The combat is mainly predicated on manipulating the emotions of you and your enemies, namely because the emotions follow a rock, paper, scissors pattern, so you can do more damage if you and your enemies are both in the right emotional state. The art is thoroughly charming with a hand-drawn look to it, and there is a lot of art, from the different emotional states to all the enemies and to the attacks. I really like the little artwork for when you switch to a different party member, it's just, it's just fucking cute. Now I might feel compelled to compare this to Undertale, and not without reason. And, uh, maybe, maybe the Shout producers... Shoutouts to Brazil from Omori. In yeah. particular, they do share ancestry, and Toby Fox did do a song for the game. But they do have different narrative hooks and different draws. Undertale draws you in with a variety of characters and the exploration of the player's relationship to them and to the game itself, while Amori is much more psychological, exploring a particular mental state and the after-effects of trauma, even if indirectly a lot of the time. Despite its cheery art style, the actual themes of the game are very dark and heavy. It's about trauma, guilt, and depression. And when the game does go into specifics, it fucking hits you like a freight train, bro. Also, Amori, it's a very expansive RPG. While detailed, Undertale was a more short and breezy experience with a small handful of side quests, while Amori has a ton of side quests to the point it was kind of overwhelming. Overall, if you like unique RPGs, psychological horror about trauma and grief, and cute shit, Amori might be for you. <laughs> the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. I'm a bit of a fan of the uh, Ace Attorney series. After playing through the original trilogy on WiiWare, of all things, I worked through the rest of the series. From the original series, to the new trilogy, to the Miles Edgeworth spinoff, to the Layton crossover, to that fighting game Phoenix was in. As of right now, the only thing I haven't played yet is the Project X-Zone sequel on that Pachinko game. I was even about to import a Japanese copy of The Great Ace Attorney to apply the fan translation to, but I don't need to now. <laughs> Playing as Ryunosuke Naruhodo, who after a series of unfortunate happenings, finds himself practicing law in the Empire of Britain at the turn of the 20th century, solving cases and unraveling conspiracies in true Ace Attorney fashion. I did truly love this collection, even if it did take a bit to get to its true heights. The first game is mostly the origin story of Ryunosuke Naruhodo. The first case is one of my favorite introductions to a new lawyer and ace attorney. He is sweating bullets, and look at how weak his death slam is, it's great. And episode 3 is one of the more interesting and subversive cases of the series, breaking away from franchise traditions to make Ryunosuke's transformation to super lawyer more gradual and more earned. However, the first game does feel mostly like setup for the second game. Not bad setup, mind you, but it's in the next game, Resolve, where things get really interesting. Episode 1 is an inversion of the first case of the first game, and it kind of makes me wish we had a moment somewhere in Ace Attorney where an assistant breaks out on their own as a lawyer. Like, permanently. Episode 2 is a solid, standard Ace Attorney mystery that would slot in with any case from one of the mainline games. Episode 3 is fucking wild. <laughs> the twists and turns, the conspiracy, the cover-up, this is what the best of Ace Attorney is made of. Then episode 4 goes fucking ham. And episode 5 is just the second part of that case. It doesn't even have a change of defendant like Dual Destinies did. I mean, a change of judge, but still. But even so, the ending case brought everything I loved from Ace Attorney together. The goofy characters, the villainy, the tragedy, the heartbreak, the impossible odds, the push and pull of legal fight and the satisfaction of your ultimate victory, tying the rest of the game's cases together surprisingly elegantly. If you're familiar with the broader Ace Attorney series, like me, you will know some reused tropes and ideas from the original trilogy, and the last case in particular, and the great Ace Attorney manages to inject them with its own flair, unlike, say, Spirit of Justice, which reused some old standing tropes in a way that felt like a less satisfying rehash of better moments that sidelined my favorite character. Look, Spirit of Justice has a lot of good moments, but it did my girl fucking dirty. But yeah, the great Ace Attorney is a great game to play from a great series, and this is as good a place to start as even the original trilogy. Metroid Dread. You know, I'm almost surprised by how much I like this game. I mean, there certainly is plenty of things to like. The platforming is as satisfying as ever, especially when going secret hunting. The atmosphere is spot on. Not only is it one of the best looking Metroid games of all time, but the visuals, while maybe cluttered from all the details, still comes together for me, especially with the sound design. From creepy labs to dangerous forests to a temple of the Chozo. And look, a Metroid game with actually good cutscenes. I love the little touches of personality the cutscenes give Samus. Like her messing with Kraid here, or her just letting her guard down when it's clear the guy approaching her is not a threat. 
This is easily the best and most nuanced portrayal of Samus as a character. What can I say? Subtlety suits her. Combat is as satisfying as it has ever been. Like look, Super Metroid is one of my favorite games of all time, but not for the combat. Like it's fine and the bosses are still fun and challenging, but the main hook is using the tools at your disposal to explore the planet and figure out where to go next. Metroid Dread is the opposite. The combat and the bosses are as good as they have ever been, but unlike the previous games, exploration isn't as much of a thing in this one when compared to, say, Super Metroid. Unlike Fusion, there isn't an explicit waypoint, but Metroid Dread is a game that puts great effort into guiding the player along and reducing backtracking, which has pros and cons. On the one hand, getting lost in Super Metroid's Labyrinth can be genuinely frustrating, where you like go from room to room desperately searching for that one door you missed, and backtracking through rooms you have been a thousand times can get dull. On the other hand, figuring out where to go next just by studying the map and learning the layout was genuinely one of the most engaging parts of Super Metroid for me. It's almost a shame how good the map is in Metroid Dread. Like, you can see what different doors are after you've activated them, and you can highlight all of a certain thing in your map. It'd be great if I ever needed to use it outside of Last Man's Secret Hunting. All that is why Super Metroid is still the best of the series for me, but Metroid Dread feels more like an improved fusion. Unstoppable enemies chasing you around, an emphasis on storytelling and attempts to reduce backtracking. Although I will admit the SAX was probably more memorable to me than the Emmy. While that approach does certainly hinder a Metroid game to an extent, those games do still have a lot going for them. In Metroid Dread's case, it has some of the best combat in the series, great atmosphere, satisfying platforming, interesting storytelling, great character work, and memorable bosses. So it's not top dog, but Metroid Dragon certainly takes second place. Neo, The World Ends With You, a sequel to the cult classic DS game, starring two teenage friends, Rindo and Fred, who while out and about in Shibuya, find themselves seemingly dead and stuck in a mysterious game called The Reaper's Game, a game that promises to grant the wish of whoever wins it. The combat of the original DS game was rather unique. You see, you control two characters, one on the top screen and the other on the bottom. You would input a combo for the top screen and use the touch screen for the character on the bottom. If that sounds overwhelming, that's kind of the point. The conflicting input style made the combat that much more satisfying to learn and get good at. Although the phone and Switch port got rid of that. Neo The World Ends With You seems to have tried to go for a similar effect. In this game, different pins are set to different buttons, with the pins having a variety of effects. It creates an interesting dynamic, where when equipping your pins, you have to think about how each pin works with each other, and in combat you need to remember what each pin does and how they would optimally interact. Do you use all your pins at once and risk running out of the usable ones, or do you use your pins in stages, and what do you use together in that case? Overall, the combat was so, like, thoroughly satisfying to me that I would just seek out battles sometimes. Also, another major appeal for me was the characters, because there's not a single character here that I don't adore. There's Rindo, the main character, who's likable if a bit misanthropic and indecisive. There's Fret, his more outgoing friend who struggles with being authentic to himself at times. There's also Minami Moto, returning from the original game, he's your first new party member. He's an incredibly intimidating man who speaks almost entirely in math buttons. Which I must say makes my math major heart very happy. How derivative! A simple equation! Perfect calculations deliver perfect results. There's Nagi, a fangirl of an Atome RPG who speaks like a LARPer, and god I love every word that comes out of this woman's mouth. Master Rindo hath shown us great favor by endowing us with the pin of legend. Victory is all but assured. I request release! How grotesque. Tis nothing short of a high tier dare. Tis I, Nagi the Edge Lord! There are other party members, but I don't want to spoil too much here. Neo The World Ends With You is truly a worthy follow-up of one of my favorite DS games of all time, keeping the spirit intact while modernizing and expanding it. And few games this year were this consistently fun and engaging all throughout. So here's me feeding my party nothing but avocado toast. Ready? Galaxy Brain, activate! Inscription, made by Daniel Mullins, aka the guy behind Pony Island and the Hex. 
part card game and part escape room. In the card game portions, you and your opponents play creatures on your sides of the board. On their turn, each creature either attacks a creature directly opposing them, or if they are unopposed, attack the opponent directly. Each point of damage given to a player is put on a scale. If the scale tips 5 points towards your opponent, you win. If it tips 5 points towards you, you lose. Like many card games, you can't just summon stronger creatures right out of the gate. You need to sacrifice cards to get stronger cards. Luckily, you have a dedicated deck of squirrels you can draw from. Squirrels are by far the weakest cards in the game, but they're mainly here to give blood to the blood god. The game does make this sacrifice feel brutal too. From the knife symbol to how each of your cards visibly trembles in fear when it's blood time. You can also summon some creatures with bone tokens, which you get when any card of yours dies. Like any good card game, there are several different effects your cards can have. From being able to be sacrificed infinitely, to attacking multiple lanes, to lowering the attack of the opposing creatures, etc, etc. The main gameplay loop is you playing this weird tabletop game with a demented looking DM as you go from event to event, fighting in card game bouts, getting items, and building your deck. By either receiving new cards, or modifying the cards you already have. Operating on a roguelike loop, you go as far as you can with your deck until you unceremoniously die. The base mechanics are very simple, but the effects in deck building at such a level of strategy and planning that it is just so much fun playing the card game and strategizing against each opponent while you're slowly building up your deck. As for the escape room elements, you can leave the table to explore the surrounding room, solving puzzles to get special items and cards that can help you out a great deal. This is also how you actually beat the game. As you might imagine from a Daniel Mullins game, it goes places. New mechanics, new developments, the works. But I don't want to spoil too much. Inscription is one of the best card game based video games I have ever played. The added layers of story and puzzle just make it better. Psychonauts 2! A sequel to the cult classic PS2 era platformer, following up after the events of the original Psychonauts and the events of the Rhombus of Ruin, that VR Psychonauts game that is also very good. Rasputin is now officially a member of the Psychonauts. Well, he's an intern anyway. Now he must learn the ropes while a new threat looms on the horizon. The best way I can describe this game is that it plays like the original Psychonauts with modern graphical fidelity. The same collectibles, the same approach to the overworld and the levels inside people's heads. And I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nostalgic for this era of platformers, and it is a joy to play and control. Like the original, the levels are inside someone's head and they give insight into the mind of the character they belong to. Both of the memory vaults exploring their literal backstory to how the level design itself shows their state of mind and how they view the world and the people around them. There are plenty of unique environments and looks associated with the different characters whose minds you explore. From a hospital turned casino, to a papercraft filled library, to a demented hellscape of flesh and teeth. There are so many fleshed out and charming characters, both old and new, it feels like a true follow up to the original, bringing back plenty of characters and following up on revelations from the end of the last game while bringing its own flavor to the table. Fun returning characters, charming side characters, and great new characters that flash out the Psychonauts as an organization while exploring a single cohesive theme. Throughout the game, there is a pervasive theme of regret of what you did, what you could have done, what should have happened. And it explores how different people might react to that kind of regret and trauma. From developing self-esteem issues, to drowning yourself in booze, to escape your demons, among other poor coping mechanisms. Also, this game is rather funny. What sort of substitutions? If I told you, it would compromise the perceived flavor profile. Isn't that just straight up dirt? Just a really charming game throughout. Good platforming, good humor, good emotions, creative levels, and lots of nostalgia. Where'd you learn how to make pancakes? Prisons. Shin Megami Tensei 5. You are an average high school student going about his life until you stumble upon a hidden truth of this world. The real Tokyo is a wasteland, and the Tokyo that you knew is a fake propped up by the miracle of a long dead god. In order to survive, you fuse with a being called Aogami to become a Nahobino. Traversing the long ruined Japan, you aid the remaining forces of this dead god. But you have a choice to make. What will become of this world? What will you build from the ashes? Whose vision of the world will you support and help make reality? Shin Megami Tensei is a long-running series at this point, running as long as some mainstays like Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, although the series didn't start consistently getting translated into English until around the PS2 era with Nocturne and Persona 3. In my mind, the main conceit for the series is that all religions and mythologies are true. In the main series, you navigate through this world, recruiting various demons to your side. 
demons being a catch-all term for the religious and mythological creatures of SMT. From angels to fallen angels to urban legends to cryptids to Japanese, Greek, Norse, and Hindu deities. What is humanity's relation to such beings? What does it mean for humanity's place in the cosmic order? Also, you can collect demons like Pokemon. Unlike other RPGs, the only set party member is the protagonist. All other slots are taken up by demons you have either recruited from battle or that you have fused, a process where you sacrifice two demons to get a new one. Yeah, this isn't like Pokemon where you keep your faith through the entire game. You want to get strong, you need to feed them to the fucking blender. One nice thing this game added to the fusion was the ability to fuse demons from the compendium, something I would have enjoyed in Persona 5 as well. It is weird seeing just how polished this game is. SMT5 feels very much like a modern interpretation of the old school series. And honestly, it is weird just seeing how polished this game is. Like, SMT is very much a niche series, and that's part of why I am so fascinated by it, but the polish does add something to the experience. The demons have never felt more alive than now, from the added animations, in particular the animations of the unique moves are all great, to the various voice lines. The recruitment dialogue is on point, and the world of the demons feels fully realized in a way that the previous games really couldn't have managed. The game looks gorgeous as well. The handful of open world maps each have a unique look to them, keeping them distinct, and there is something about how the game handles light and its skyboxes that really captivated me. Like, the rays of light here look amazing, and sometimes I would just take in the beauty of this otherworldly sky. This ruin Tokyo was fantastic to explore, as it turns out I'm really into open world exploration. I had a lot of fun just exploring the world, finding out how to get to the collectibles scaring about, finding interesting demons and new side quests. Most of the time you're exploring these big open areas, the only exceptions are two more traditional dungeons. I like them just fine, even if they did drag sometimes, but they have nothing on the more open areas. There is a great feeling on finally figuring out how to get somewhere you are having trouble getting to. Like the previous games, the combat can be rather difficult, especially early game. Like if you manage to get like a couple levels ahead of whatever you're fighting, like it can be fairly breezy, but you know, at the beginning, shit will kill you. SMT feels very much like a continuation of the trends of SMT. In particular, this feels like a parallel to Noct. Nocturne was about a chaotic lawless wasteland where you must fend for yourself, on SMT5 you are a soldier of a holy order fighting against the agents of chaos. Even the designs of the protagonists echo the sentiment. The Demi Fiend is a shirtless intimidating presence ready to punch anything into submission, while the Nahobino is a pretty boy with flowing locks and the power of god and anime on his side. The game feels very much like Atlas attempting to push SMT into a more mainstream position, banking on the success of the Connected Persona series. It certainly had more than its fair share of trailers. As for how the two series compare, there are a great many similarities. The combat in Persona is derived from the press turn system that originated in Nocturne and that SMT5 also uses. A similar idea implemented in a different way, basically. The main difference between the series is in narrative goals, I think. Persona is very much about the power of friendship, no homo. It's about learning the inner machinations of the various people around you. The point that you probably spend more time reading than fighting. <laughs> SMT, however, is not so much about the interiority of its characters, but instead those characters are vessels to explore its ideas. They do exist as people, they aren't shallow characters, but SMT is more concerned with seeing the reasoning behind a view of the world and the type of people that view might appeal to. Who sees comfort in deferring to the law of God, who would seek an end to gods and demons alike, and so forth. Now, personally, I don't see this as downgrade, but everyone's got their taste. Now, one thing I will say is that the time between story beats is particularly long in this game. Like, to start, you see the opening cutscene, are introduced to the world, and then it's like 10 hours of wandering through the desert before your next story beat. This can make the story feel kind of sparse to begin with, even if there's probably not less story content. Contrast this with Persona, which feels like the story is always moving along, always getting updates with the characters. Even if a particular dungeon is taking you a while, you know at the end of it is the next story update. Now, personally, I didn't mind it in this game because I really liked exploring this desert, but you know, it is still a while before your second story beat. So overall, SMT5 is an engaging and difficult RPG with fascinating ideas and an interesting philosophical plot and a level of polish I wasn't expecting for the series. Just don't expect the same consistent plot progression and character interiority as Persona. Also, it's okay if people don't like as much as Persona. Stop being weird about people's tastes. So that was some games I liked. Goodbye.
Phantom Chapter 2 was pretty cool. I actually think I like it more than Undertale now because of that single chapter. It was pretty cool. I like Queen.